Good morning. Um, morning, everyone. I, I want, first of all, to um, embarrassed by what Merrick said. There's nothing worse than a big build-up because you can only fail uh, in relation to what's been said before. But I'm going to get my revenge on him, actually, because um, I think what Merrick has done for the Landscape Institute in talking a lot about these big issues of landscape at the landscape scale, the relationship with agriculture, and, and a strategic view of what's happening um, has made me feel you know, very proud to be a member of the Landscape Institute. I think this is exactly the kind of message that we need. And I think that, that key message right at the start, this is a critical moment in the history of our landscape, is one we're going to return to several times today. So having had this invitation from, from Merrick and Fola to come today, um, I did what a lot of people do. I, sort of looked, I looked on, on the web and I thought, well, how can I start a, a, a talk well? Because if you don't grab people's attention in the first two minutes, you might as well not bother. So the advice from this American sage was, there are three things you can do. First of all, you can ask your audience a question. So a question, who in this room was alive during the Second World War? <laughs> Well, I thought I'd be the only one, but <laughs> I'm pleased to see Hal and some other useful gentleman looking over there. So that, anyhow, that's, that in a sense is, is one justification why I'm going to be talking about. The second thing our American friend said was really important to give them a staggering fact. So staggering fact, um, a modern tractor can work the land in a day that took 100 men to work it in a week. So it's, it's a factor of 700. It's just, kind of, just a figure that gives you an idea of how dramatically uh, our relationship with land has changed, um, and much of that in the lifetime of at least of three of us in this room. And the third thing American Sage said is tell a story. So basically what I'm going to talk about is a story. It's a story of that relationship between agriculture and, and the landscape in the course of my lifetime, but with a certain number of personal anecdotes, because as Merrick has said, I had the fortune to be around at one or two critical stages. So come with me on that, that journey, as the Americans would say. <laughs> now, I'm not sure how, is this, is, this the, is this the fellow that moves the things? Oh, it's, it's come, suddenly come alive. That one will be the okay, from now onwards, I hope I don't need any technical help at all. Right, this was actually painted just a few months before I was born. I was born right at the start of 1940. And this is the kind of image of the countryside that is captured of the countryside of the a, a very um, diverse, beautiful countryside. Lots of people in that landscape. Look at the height of technology over here. Lots of different kinds of animals. It, it doesn't come out quite so clearly, but there are pigs and there are cows and so forth. The whole thing is, 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 um, is beautiful. It's nostalgic. It's what appeals to us. Uh, and this landscape... Um, we must remember, had evolved over centuries. It wasn't just the, the product of the 1930s. It had come down through hundreds or thousands of years of history. Um, much of it was pretty small scale, both the, the fields themselves and the farms, the farm units too. Um, and this was often mixed operations. Just going back to something that Merrick said at the start, most of the farming operations had both a crop uh, growing and a a livestock rearing element, and indeed they were often perceived as linked together so that, for example, the fertilizer from the animals was used to enrich the soil. And it was very varied and distinctive region by region. And, and that map you saw of the 159 landscape character areas would have been more pronounced in the differences in those days than it is now. It wasn't very productive, uh, and in fact, uh, farming was in a long time depression during the war, between the wars. But it was full of people and animals, that not just the obvious the horses were there, which have now rapidly replaced by tractors after the war, but a lot of people working in the land too. Rich in nature and history, without doubt. Uh, inspiring for writers and artists. I, a few weeks ago, I went to see a fantastic exhibition of Eric Revillius's drawings in, in, at um, Compton Verney. And if you didn't see it there, maybe you saw it in Dulwich earlier. And he's a, He's a, a, a great artist capturing all that. But it was hard, dirty work, and one should not romanticise what it was about. But it was so important to the psyche of the British people that it was kind of used as an iconic uh, message for um, making people um, committed to, to the war, to the war effort, 
This was what they were trying to save in, when they fought the Germans in the war. Ironically, the war brought about a very dramatic change in the, in the landscape itself. We see um, you know, just a couple of facts. Before the war, we were importing 70% of our food, which is really extraordinary considering it's now 40%, 45%. But by the end of the war, we were growing three quarters of it. So you could, you, that was achieved not by people eating less food, because in fact they probably ate better in the wartime period than on the average than they had previously, but by producing much more food. And, and we had a 50% increase, for example, in the amount of land that was under the plough. And the landscape was accordingly dramatically altered in those war years. And um, the war year was also a dramatic impact on the landscape in another way, in, in helping people to think strategically about the future of land use in Britain. Because after the, through the war experience, the sense of, of land being um, at a resource that was limited, the pre-war problems of the Depression, the appalling housing conditions and so forth, there was a comprehensive commitment by government and a lot of uh, people of great skill and dedication to reshaping the countryside and the landscape, and indeed our cities after the war. And five great reports were produced, and one of those was the Scott Report on the land utilisation in rural areas. Now, this is a, a kind of really interesting report because I think it was underpinned by a couple of assumptions. It was a sort of group of wise people at the time. Scott uh, was, I think, a High Court judge. He didn't have any particular um, countryside experience. There were a couple of shared assumptions in this. One is that farming was never again become a neglected industry. That, that, all that experience of the pre-war pre and earlier years of farming and depression, that must, be, that must be finished and be put behind us. And the other is that a prosperous agriculture would bring benefits to the farmers and to the nation's food supply. So they saw the, kind of the need for that. That was a unified view, but the, the report team group then broke into a majority and a minority report with very different philosophical view, view about that relationship. The majority of the report, to which Scott himself was the principal author, assumed that following this course it would lead to the resuscitation of village life and country life and, and, and the preservation of amenities. And what we needed to do to do that was to protect farming, protect it from urban development, urban sprawl, and to a degree from, from the import of food in the future. So it was a very protective view. The other minority report, with a man called Denison, who was principally behind that, took what, with hindsight, we can see was a much more realistic view, that farming actually would need to be dramatically changed to adopt 20th century technology, business ideas, and so forth, and that this would have a, a, a big impact on the landscape. And the post-war set of legislation, that, that both key pieces of legislation enacted in 1947, embodied these two different ideas. So the protection of farming was it built into the 1947 Town and Planning, Planning Act, which, of course, farming and forestry operations were outside the planning system altogether. They were given a very special status. But the Agriculture Act, which came out in the same year, was enacted in the same year, really aimed to encourage uh, the, the modernisation of farming and to make sure that we were, had greater food security in future. So there's always a tension in those two ideas, and they go right back to that report. Now, I, from time to time, I'm going to show a few slides with a little red heading, and that's to remind you, remind me, that this is a little personal anecdote. So my first memories of this kind of farm landscape were, I suppose, the relics of what had not been swept away in the war. So I can remember clearly many, many fields with haystacks and the stooks below, particularly from visits to Cornwall, holiday, but that could have been anywhere in England. And I can remember even in my first job, um, which was working up in the, with the, what was then the Nature Conservancy in, in Grange over Sands, taking a steam train from Euston through that landscape on the top right. I was just astonished. Looked out of the window on a winter's day through, as you went through Northamptonshire and Warwickshire, and you saw the whole thing was, com was completely like a sort of, you know, ribbed. Yeah. It was all ridge and furrow. It was the whole landscape, almost, almost without exception, had been created by our ancestors hundreds of years ago, toiling up and down with oxen. And it was an extraordinary discovery. For me, it was. And, and then down the right-hand corner, my grandmother lived in Crowborough in Sussex on the edge of the Dashdown Forest. And we used to go for, took me out for walks with her two dogs. 
And we would be, we'd see these guys, the charcoal burners in the woods, and only later, and I think these, this is the, the last vestige of a tradition that had been there for thousands of years. These were semi-itinerant guys. I don't know what they did with the, with, the, with the charcoal. I mean, they might have made charcoal for my mother, who was an artist, to draw with, but I couldn't think there was much market otherwise, because nobody had ever heard of a barbecue at that stage. So this was the end of an industry um, that was very important in shaping the landscape. Anyhow, uh, with rather boring slides, it's just, just to tell you that that landscape, the remnants of it, were subject to huge pressures and changes um, in the subsequent years. As, as the farming revolution set in train by postal legislation uh, and, and, the, and the innovations in technology and agriculture takes, takes root. The mechanization of farming, horses and people disappear from the fields, the fields become larger. Chemicalization, so you've got, uh, you know, Herbicide, fungicide, pesticide, homicide, suicide, all the sides you've ever heard of, doing, doing things to the landscape in a very dramatic way. Uh, land improvement, the field drainage everywhere, improving the pastures, all that's having a very dramatic effect too. Livestock rearing much more intensively, sweep away those silly old, old barns for animals and create major new at-cost structures of, um, uh, and so forth. So all that is changing the appearance of the landscape. Uh, concentration and specialization in place of mixed farming, so you, you, you no longer have a mixed operation, you become a guy who, who grows barley or has um, dairy cattle or whatever. Business skills applied to farming, a very important part of that. My um, chairman, I'll come back to him later, Derek Barber, was a key part of that story of bringing business skills to farming and, and making farmers think of themselves as businessmen, uh, which is a totally new innovation at that stage. Uh, yields have dramatically increased. As you can see, this is the yield in wheat, uh, cereal yield, per tons per hectare, which increases between three and fourfold in this period, and uh, other changes as well. So, in, and what does it all mean to the landscape? Well, I'm just telling you something which you know very well, but it's just, again, to be reminded of the, quite the scale of this. Um, between 1945 and 1990, all this period, the removal of hedgerows is far exceeding the rate at which they're being replanted. Average field size increased by two-thirds in certain parts of the country, by much more than that, of course. Um, the hedges, are, if they're there, are badly managed and they don't contribute nothing to, to wildlife. And the reason for that? Well, the enlargement of fields, certainly, the loss of agricultural labour. Uh, Stubble burning, which was an absolutely hor hor horrid practice that got very strongly rooted in, in, in the agricultural industry and was finally banned in 1992. Um, and spray drift, and of course even the hedges that remained were crudely trimmed and neglected, or many of them were. So this is a dramatic change in the appearance of the landscape. The second big change was the loss of the post-war meadows. So this is perhaps the most dramatic of all. 90% of the flower-rich meadows that were there after the war had gone by the 1980s. Um, this is the combination of the improvement of pasture and the switch from making hay to making silage. Uh, the third big change was what we did to the wet bits. Uh, drainage of you've got nationally important areas like Somerset Levels and the Broads, we'll come back to later, which were... Uh, areas which were, were, were uh, which were being drained for more intensive forms of agriculture, but there's also the micro level, the loss of farm ponds, the small things that were done in in the fields, widespread use of field drains, uh, watercourses being canalised, and so forth and so on, and pollution effects. And the final big change is what happened in the uplands, um, and particularly in areas that have been designated as national parks where many of much of the rough country, the open country, the heather moorland, not always heather, but often heather moorland, was lost uh, through as the agri intensive agriculture moved up the hill. Most pronounced in mid-Wales, um, but with also dramatic impacts in, uh, in other national parks. The one exception is Dartmoor, which was a national park whose landscape is, owes a great deal to commoning, which was not so affected by this change. So... Um, I joined the Countryside Commission in 1968 at its founding. Um, and I, one of the first things I went to was what was called the Countryside in 1970 Conference. This is a bit complicated. That this, was a, this was a program of, which led up to an eventual event in 1970 at 
Guildhall in London, but it began in the 60s. And as you can see, we're all much younger in those days. Um, and uh, the Countryside Commission was one of the, the bodies which was created through the, uh, through the process of the Countryside in 1970 inquiries. And that looked, that really began to sound the alarm on some of the things that were happening in the countryside and began to talk about having a way in which we can try and bring the agricultural and landscape communities closer together, maybe through some form of compensation, but we just couldn't go on as we were. So that was the sort of message coming out of the, um, the conference. And they said Countryside Commission was one of the instruments by which harmonisation should be achieved. And at the same time, the NGOs were getting pretty restive. Um, the CPRE, which had previously been mainly concerned with ribbon development and poor quality urban development, was getting increasingly agitated about the impact of modern agriculture on the landscape. The ramblers ditto, but worried about loss of access. Uh, and even the nature conservation bodies, who hitherto had concentrated on looking at nature reserves, began to think, hey, well, what's going on outside the nature reserves? And, and that's having a dramatic impact indeed on what's going on inside the nature reserves as well. So, um, the Countryside Commission uh, came into being, but in a context in which I think agriculture was still somewhat defensive about um, the situation. And I would have said that often you found um, with an agricultural audience that you'd be told, well, you know, actually all is well. The farmer really does know best. And if we can earn a good living from the, from the land, then as in the past, you'll get a good landscape. It follows as night follows day. Um, and even if you've got concerns, we've got all these in national parks and OMBs. I mean, surely they'll protect the landscape adequately. Um, and in any case, if something needs to be done, it's best done on a voluntary basis and not by compulsion. That was a message. Now, um, I see Andrew is sitting at the back of the room. Um, your, uh, your long predecessor, Michael Dark, does name mean anything to you? Parliamentary advisor to NFU in 1970. He was an, I worked with him at that stage um, in the countryside in 1970. And I found a quote from something you read. It's a bit complicated. It's the challenge he put to the conservationists was this. You should say to us farmers, we accept the necessary changes in agricultural practice, but we charge you, the farmers, to build a new and better landscape. So that, that was what the charge... And so we tried in new agricultural landscapes which is a project which was initiated about 1972, I think, um, to take up that challenge. And I'm glad that we've got Hal Moggish here because you were involved in this, Hal. This is a gross oversimplification of what we were trying to do, but the question we were asked, trying to answer was, how can agriculture improvements be carried out efficiently in such a way they create new landscapes no less interesting than those that they replace? Um, and to do this, we chose seven areas, as, as case studies to look at what was happening, what had happened, what was happening, and what might happen to the landscape in future. So I just took, found one. I found this with the help of a former colleague. Um, I couldn't find my own copy. I think I threw it out. We moved house. We threw, I threw out an awful lot of the historic documents to the Countryside Commission, which I regret twice mm. a day. <sighs> yeah, do be careful when you move house. <laughs> um, so th this is a kind of typical state page study. Farm landscape as it is, um, quite lots of fields. Farm landscape as it is likely to be, as it were, if nothing happened. And farm landscape as it could be, as a result of the discussions between the landscape architect team and the farmers. Now, the big difference, it's quite interesting you look at it, it's not really that the fields are smaller, but that the field boundaries, in many cases, have become quite significant blocks of woodland. And th that was perceived as being an area... So the farmers could, as it were, continue to do what they wanted to do in, more, in terms of more intensive production. And nature conservation and landscape would get its payback by getting more bits in between. But it didn't really work. And the Countryside Commission published in 1974 its conclusions, which were that the voluntary approach, which was the basis for that, because there was no legislation to make it happen, and not much by way of resources, was that this was too small scale, it would lack teeth, um, and it was actually working against the prevailing trend of policy. And the incentives were still, remember, to remove, as you've heard, hedges and features from the landscape, not to replace them. And so the Commission said, very, very tentative, we need a new framework, one that would stop the removal of landscape features that we valued, encourage more planting of trees and greenery, and provide, importantly, finance and advice to farmers. 
So that was 1974. Um, just a footnote, New York Cultural Landscapes didn't end then. It went on, and the latest publication was in 2016, it was two years ago, and was shortlisted for a Landscape Institute Award. And the, what, they, what the authors have done, and I think it is now in the property of the Landscape uh, LUC, so Kate may know about that, is that <clears throat> um, it's become a way of monitoring change in the study areas and what's happened. And actually, just, just a footnote, a passing comment, many of the, some of the awful things that were predicted haven't happened, actually. And one or two of the areas that has been, at least in more recent years, um, quite a significant improvement in, in the landscape quality. But that's another story. Oh, we've jumped. We've jumped out of order. Oh, no, one minute. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. That's not right, no. So the other, the other initiative that we, I might mention from these, this is 1968, 1974 in the countryside, was countryside management. This was the work of that gentleman on the far right. And who in this room remembers Reg Hookway? Oh, good, that's lovely. I, if, his, if his family were, were around, they'd be delighted to know that. Reg Hookway was, was my predecessor at the Countryside Commission, an inspiring, um, noisy, uh, self-confident, amusing uh, Devonian who had a passion for the countryside. Um, did upset a few people on the, on the way. Um, but one of, the, one of his, his really exciting ideas was this, that he, he, he was a planner by training. He said that the planning had got obsessed with, with in the countryside. It had no role, really significant role in the countryside other than stopping bad development. Everything else was, was with farmers. and Everything else was about management. So people concerned about the future of the countryside need to be concerned about the management of the countryside, not its planning so much. And he was trying to see if there were ways in which the public interest in the management of that landscape for environmental purposes could be funded or could be made to happen. And he developed a couple of projects, one of which I was quite closely involved in, Upland, Upland Management. So I went off as his kind of junior aide off to the Lake District to find a man called John Bailey. He was an astonishing man. He was about six foot five tall. And he would walk through bitterly cold afternoons in, in the Lake District in shirt sleeves. But he, with a small amount of money, he began to talk to farmers about building walls, rebuilding walls, improving access to fields, planting a few trees, all the little fine details of the landscape that were being neglected by the current system. And that actually became so important that, as Paul Tiplady and others will know, it became part of the, the sort of mainstream of national park management. And we did a similar project in the Bolin Valley, uh, in the urban fringe experiment south of, of um, Manchester, and that too became part of local authority thinking. I think it's here that the germ of environmental payments actually can first be found, agri-environmental payments. Now, you may wonder, what on earth is that? I, <laughs> I, went, I went to Kenya to work for the, National, the United Nations Environment Programme for four years. That interesting time, but I'm not here to talk to you about that. But during 1976, I came back and home leave to Britain, and this was, to me, the most dramatic change in the landscape that I'd ever seen. These fantastic galleons of trees, most beautiful trees, had just gone, or well, they were all dying. That was even worse. It was spread out from the port ports where the timber was introduced. Good demonstration of the kind of international nature of, of, of the environment that we have, and how it's susceptible to international influences, from Gloucester, Tilbury Docks, and later from Manchester, and the loss of the country on the landscape was huge. I went from, Switz from uh, Kenya to Switzerland. I, on, we live near this lake, though not unfortunately in that chateau. And um, we were there. Meanwhile, back in England, or back in Britain, things were getting hotter still. And there were a series of, of major controversial cases. The, the plying up of moorland and, on Exmoor, which was resolved partially by the Porchester Inquiry, and then highly controversial issues around nature conservation, the draining of wetlands, the Amberley Wild Brooks, a lovely area in Sussex, Gedney Drove end up on the wash and so forth. And at each of these occasions, an awful lot of aggro and anger between different groups, and it was a bad time. So when I came back to head up the Countryside Commission in 1981, I found what was essentially a kind of crisis between landscape, wildlife, access, heritage, and farming. And farming seen as out of control um, in, by many of those in, in the conservation world. And that was captured by this mild-mannered lady, Marion Sherwood, who I think has got some connections with Reading, actually. 
um, who wrote a book called Motive, The Theft of the Countryside. Although few people realise it, the English landscape is under sentence of death. It's already been carried out. The executioner is the figure traditionally viewed as the custodian of the royal sea and the farmer. So this was kind of really bad time, really bad time. And um, it was not a productive time either. The response, initially political response, was in the 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act, which was dragged somewhat unwillingly from the newly elected Conservative government. Um, and insofar as the landscape was concerned, the resolution that was proposed was paying, in rather limited circles, for profits foregone if a farmer agreed not to plough a particular area, largely areas in national parks and so forth. And it was attacked at once by people like Malcolm McEwen, who had been a advocate for national parks as blackmail, creating a situation for blackmail. And it not very much came of that, actually. So quite quickly, things went from bad to worse. And we were faced in the Countryside Commission with a proposal affecting the Halvergate Marshes. Now, just a piece of geography. Halvergate Marshes lies between the Bure and the Yare, just west of, of Great Yarmouth. It's a core area in the Broads, which hadn't yet become a national park, but was on its, on, on its way to becoming so. And there already was a, a broad, special broads authority set up. Um, this was uh, a, a very extensive area. It's important to remember this had all been drained. It was drained by the Dutch in, in about 1650. But what was now being proposed was deep draining. You wouldn't need a nice windmill for that. And, and then you'd convert it all to barley. And this was going to be a major hole in the middle of the landscape, um, which was so regarded as so very beautiful. So the marshes might have ended up looking like wall-to-wall -wall barley. And because it had become so controversial, and I think because of all the other conflict, conflicting things that had happened before, the government this time decided that something ought to be done. And they responded to the appeal from the Broads Authority and the Countryside Commission. We used Countryside Commission powers. We had this extraordinary power to undertake experiments, which is hardly limited by any qualification at all, uh, which is great. Which is great. Um, we uh, put together a team with funding from MAF, um, from Department of Environment, Ministry of Agriculture, Broads Authority, and we put them in the field, and they worked with a budget, quite a generous budget, talking to farmers, and they were not saying to farmers, you mustn't do this, but we will offer you this funding if you do that instead. So it was about rewarding and encouraging good management, payments for uh, land management and la in, in the traditional way, and maintaining, but that, the certain conditions, maintaining grassland, limiting stocking rates, cutting use of chemicals, and it worked fundamentally. The, this, this area is still not looking like that, but like it did on the previous page. Mm -hmm. So I think that this was a very significant turning point in the history of, of this relationship. Because for the first time in modern languages, public funds were used for public goods in support of environmentally sensitive farming. It became the, the prototype for the ESA's Environmentally Sensitive Areas Scheme. It actually was rolled out across Europe. Interesting in the obsession I forgive me saying so, the obsession the British have about being run by Europe. This was an idea that was sold through the EU to the rest of Europe under Article 19. And it was the forerunner of stewardship and other agri-environmental schemes. A really important moment, I think. Um, just a few more things that were going on at the same time in the, in the very active period in the Countryside Commission's history. Uh, following on from Halvergate, we rolled out, with the government's encouragement, a national programme of ESAs a program in which we worked with the Nature Conservancy Council, so a little footnote here, really interesting that we brought together for the first time landscape and nature conservation in the way in which we looked, looked, at, looked at the whole countryside. Long overdue in my view, and I was delighted that we've made that, that kind of agreement because I found that distinction artificial and uncomfortable. But throughout a varied set of places, varied as the, the Norfolk, certain obvious national parks, Exmoor, but also areas of, of high nature conservation value and all areas of high landscape value as well. So ESAs um, became part of the agri-environmental scheme, a way of resolving some of those conflicts. And then, and then it began to take, pick up speed even more and become even wider in its implications. So set-aside land, which was 
um, introduced in, the, in 1989 as the European Union began to run into surpluses. Um, what we do with set-aside land, just leave it and throw, throw weed killer at it, or use it more positively? Well, we thought we could use it more positively, so we developed with the government a project called Countryside Premium Scheme, which introduced the idea of a, a menu approach, so farmers could choose from a, a range of different options as to how they could improve the set-aside land and bring environmental benefits from it. Um, we, we built on that with a proposal in 1989 that there should be a country-wide uh, system of menus, environmental menu options, available to all farmers. That was a proposal, and that was picked up and endorsed by Chris Patton in the Environment White Paper in 1990. And I can remember going to a meeting at, at which he practically embraced us for saying, well, this is exactly what I've been looking for. I want to do this. I want to make a big impact. So he was quite excited about it, got built into that. And in 1991, the Countryside Commission launched that idea as a five-year pilot. My chairman, I'll be with him if it's a problem. My chairman, Derek Barber, who sadly died last year, but he reached the age of 99, sitting in the room, he said, we should call this Countryside Stewardship. I thought, that, that, that's really good. I couldn't think of a, a, better, a better description of it. Uh, that became, a, a, as you know, a, a, a widespread scheme picked up by MAF subsequently and then replaced in due course by environmental stewardship. So, so just kind of summary of that history, and I apologise again for the self-indulgent personal bits in it, but, but the, the, perhaps what makes it come alive. Um, the landscape before 1940 was the mostly beautiful, beautiful but largely accidental byproduct of farming, or in some cases the, the deliberate actions of large landowners. That breaks down that relationship between 1940 and 1980. The initial response, I think, was denial and confusion, and then recourse to voluntary efforts, new agricultural landscapes, experiments, and so forth, which really largely failed. FWAG, I would put it, rather in the same field, too, although I think it has a role. So did a compensation approach. I don't think that, that was ever intellectually uh, possible or politically desirable. But countryside management experiments devised by the Countryside Commission, I think, showed a way forward. And from around about 1980, you begin to get a common understanding that a good farm landscape must be paid for. And it's in the, through that you get the emergence of an agro-environmental agri schemes. Little pilots initially, Halvergate, pilot e limited ESAs, countryside premium, countryside stewardship. That is, where, in a sense, the foundations to where we are now. Uh, it's now, I think, accepted that a beautiful farm landscape is a public good. It should be provided by farmers, along with the other elements, biodiversity protection, soil protection, clean water, carbon storage, care of heritage, public access, and indeed, as you said earlier, Merrick, food production for sustainable use too. All of that must be purchased with public funds. And that's tied up in Michael Goh's Oxford speech, the 25-year environmental plan, the new food, the new food uh, white paper, elms and so forth. But, you know, right, running through all this must be now, a beautiful farm landscape must be paid for. The question obviously is, are we prepared to pay for it? Thank you. <laughs>